Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert. There are three motivations. You've got cash, status, ideology. If you're installing ransomware because of ideology, you're not giving back the data. You don't really care about the ransom. That's just a benefit. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're seeing that ransomware is also being installed because of this ideology or maybe even because of status. The attacker really doesn't care or is not going to give back the data. That presents an entirely new problem. That was former United States Most Wanted, Brett Gollum Fun Johnson, referred to by the United States Secret Service as the original Internet Godfather, who was a central figure in the cybercrime world for almost 20 years and now works as a security consultant and public speaker. This is the first of a couple of pretty interesting episodes we have for you. I think you're going to enjoy it. First, a conversation between Brett Johnson and Steve Durbin, Managing Director of the Information Security Forum. In this episode, Brett answers Steve's most pressing questions about where cybercrime is growing, the increasing problem with ransomware, how to guard against spear phishing, and more. Got some quick questions for you. Sure. So cybercrime... Last year, estimated to be about a $600 billion business, something like 2.8 million victims per day. How do you think it's going to grow? Oh, geez. I, th I think it's just going to continue to grow. Uh, one of the things I've been looking at is uh, your more skilled cyber criminals. And I don't care if it's the upper tier hackers, which there are very few actual you know hackers out there. Most of them are just social engineers. Right. Um, the, what I've been looking at is that concept of patience defining the future of cybercrime as we go forward. So if you look at something like synthetic fraud, for example, mm -hmm. if you take a criminal that is more patient, that doesn't try to cash out immediately, the profit potential starts to ramp up. If you look at uh, setting up fraudulent bank accounts and things like that, we knew even when I was doing it back a decade ago, we knew that you know the first 30 days, if you set up a fraudulent bank account, the first 30 days there are fraud flags at the wazoo. So mm -hmm. you don't launder money through that account for 30. Criminals are now starting to understand, well, it's not just 30 because now authentication isn't binary. It's consistent. So the longer we pretend to be legitimate, the more legitimate the account looks, the more money we can launder through, the higher the profit potential is on cash outs. So that concept of patience, I think, is going to define – the overall arc of how cyber criminals act, as far as the structure of marketplaces and forums and all that. So Alpha Bay was shut down July 5th of last year. Mm -hmm. All right, It was the largest network in the world at that point, 240,000 members. What they didn't know was that Hansa Market was shut down at the same time. So <laughs> Alpha Bay shuts down. Basically, law enforcement comes on and they say, hey, all you guys head over to Hansa Market. We're setting up a shop there. So they head over there. Two weeks later, Hansa shuts down, and it, it comes out as a law enforcement investigation. That sowed so much dissension and paranoia within the entire cybercrime community that a lot of these guys, they started to think, well, you know, there may be some sort of exploit on tour that allows law enforcement to gather real IP addresses, not considering it was their own security faults that were doing that. Right. So um, – because of that, we started to see a lot of guys migrate away from the marketplaces and the darknet forums, and they started setting up shop on Reddit subreddits or Facebook hidden groups, things like a lot of clearnet stuff was going on. We're seeing that migration back to the darknet now, but at the same time, these large marketplaces like Dream Market, like uh, Alpha Bay, Silk Road, things like that, those marketplaces exist as a natural extension, this kind of logical extension of the overall forum structure, that large communication channel. You have to have, you must have that forum type or that large communication structure. That way you know who to buy from, who to trust, who might be a law enforcement, who to network with, everything else. You don't have to have the marketplace structure. So I think we're going to see as time goes on, and there's this realization happening now that that's the truth. So a lot of these guys are now migrating for sales or actual business transactions. They're migrating to these smaller and smaller encrypted messaging channels, uh, mm -hmm. Jabber, Wicker, WhatsApp, things like that. And that depends on basically what region of the world you're in as to what app you use for that. But I think that's what we're seeing is we're, we'll see the business. The large communication channel will remain. Actual business transactions will take place on smaller encrypted channels. And then criminals are just going to get more and more patient as time goes on as well. Okay. Let's talk about ransomware, estimated to have grown something like 350% last year. Right. How do you see that 
evolving over the next 12 to 18 months? Well, I am the uh, – <laughs> I was asked about that two years ago. And I was like, you know what? It's a great business model. And I think that as a business, it's just going to continue to grow. And I, 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 I went on to say that uh, – what I thought would happen is as that business model becomes more of a business itself, we'll see that that people who pay ransom, the attackers will actually give the data back because if they didn't, what's, what's the incentive to pay ransom right. to begin with? Well, it, it turns out that I was only thinking about that from a monetary standpoint. So right. that motivation is cash. Well, there are three motivations. You've got cash, status, ideology. If you're installing ransomware because of ideology – you're not giving back the data. You don't really care about the ransom. That's just a benefit. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're seeing that ransomware is also being installed because of this ideology or maybe even because of status. The attacker really doesn't care or is not going to give back the data. That presents an entirely new problem because if it's just forecast, you have a lot of people out there, bit payment and things like that. Mm -hmm. Those guys give back the data. Right. Not only do they give back the data, but they actually have customer service that will remote in <laughs> and make sure you get the data back. Right. The other attackers aren't like that. So, And not only that, but if you pay the ransom, you're just making the crime more prolific at that point. They're just going to tell oh, it worked here. It'll work someplace else. I'm not for paying ransom at all. I'm for doing making sure everything's backed up. Making sure it's backed up properly though because, uh, hell, this is last month. I get a call from a, a medical supply firm out of Knoxville, Tennessee, and they'd been hit with bit paymer. Right. And my first question was, do you have backups? And they're like, absolutely. The backups are sitting right next to the computer. They're encrypted too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, serious? And they're like, yep, everything's encrypted. And I'm like, uh, bit paymer, you're not going to, uh, to unlock those computers without the ransom. Yep. And uh, I was like, how much is the ransom? Well, it's a small company. They're like $375,000. And I'm like, can you pay it? And they're like, no. Right. And because uh, the PGA, I, I, yeah, I'm not under NDA with anything. So the PGA, when they were in with bit payment, they paid. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like, can you pay it? No. I'm like, well, the only way you're getting that data back is to pay it. So um, I'm I'm not sure what happened with that company or not. They went off on their own. But uh, I think that uh, we're going to see ransomware continue. But that's the thing with most of these crimes, whether it be phone porting or what have you, it starts in one area, but it bleeds over into others. So I think that what we see with ransomware is we first saw it with major corporations, with cities and things like that. Now we're seeing it with SMBs and it's going it, to, you know, it first started with people, with consumers. I think we're going to see it bleed back to consumers as well. As, as ransomware becomes more prolific, we're going to see everyone being hit with it. I, I think is what happens. Okay. Another one for you, spear phishing. Sure. But particularly CEOs, CFOs, we're seeing that trend now. Right. How do we raise a level of awareness <laughs> amongst those guys? Because they're never going to get hit, right? That's the well, attitude. That's the attitude. And they don't understand that, especially with spear phishing, you're talking about an 86% success rate. If someone decides to spearfish you, you are done at that point. Raising awareness. It's – if you're looking at the way spear phishing is done. So over in the UK and the EU, you've got DMARC that's been implemented. Yep. So an attacker cannot spoof a company's domain. So he has to rely on free domains. He has to rely on like domains. Well, like domains is where the money is, right? So right. I own anglerfish.com. I can register a Unicode domain. With anglerfish.com, it would be the I without the dot on it. Right. And it looks exactly like it's supposed to look. Um, and we're talking business email compromise. But from there, what you do is you go to LinkedIn, you find a target, mm -hmm. you spearfish the target, and you go to town from that point. How do you stop that? That becomes an entirely new issue all of a sudden. Um, you're absolutely right on raising awareness. I think that what you have to do is you have to make sure that when you're doing security awareness training – that the training has to be in the exact same manner that a criminal would do it. Right. Time and again, I've worked with companies that they do security awareness training or they do pen testing, but they don't do pen testing with the actual criminal products. They try to simulate it with mm -hmm. whatever product they've got that's legal. I don't believe in that. Uh, same thing with phishing training. I worked with, with a company, a large Fortune 50 company, that uh, while I was there, they sent out the simulated phishing emails. And the email that they sent out said, uh, we've added two more days, our vacation time to the calendar. Right. It didn't tell what those two days were. It just had a PDF file, said calendar. 
Right. <laughs> the question was, how many people will click on it? The answer was everyone. Yep. That in that specific company, that caused so much anger that everyone that clicked on it raised so much hell that the company then sent out a memo saying, we will never send out another phishing campaign like this again. You will always know when we're sending out phishing campaigns. If you're doing that, that first is the exact same way that you need to do security awareness. That's mm-hmm. how you need to train people to give in because people clicked on it yep. and say, we've changed it so you'll know everything that's going on from now on. That's the exact wrong way to do it at that point. So it, it's it's how you implement training. Are you doing it the correct way or are you just you know, pushing the buttons and going by the numbers? That's yep. the problem. And too many times, especially with, with things like HIPAA, mm-hmm. things like that, the HIPAA awareness training is – a video or, you know, a quick set of questions that you answer and and that's it. That's not the way to do security awareness training. It needs to be consistent across the line. It needs to be done the – if you're doing pen testing or whatever, it needs to be done the exact same way that an attacker would do it. That way the person recognizes what's going on. Okay. What makes a company a good target for a cyber criminal? Oh, geez. (laughs) Well, okay. So let's say I'm looking for iPhones. Okay. All right. A new guy will go to Apple and will try to use stolen credit card information to get a product from Apple, all right? And he's going to fail miserably because Apple has outstanding security. The more seasoned guy, he'll want the iPhones, but he's going to look for a company that has – that's a smaller company, hopefully a a small mom-and-pop store because he knows that that company can't afford security. Right. The expert guy, he may go back to Apple. Because he may understand that I need to use local credit cards. I need to use a Sox 5 proxy or a remote desktop that's local to the card owner itself. Depending on the year, depending on the time, he may try to uh, – there's any number of things that make a company a target. I like to say that if a company makes money off a of product or service, a criminal will make money off the same product or service. All mm-hmm. right. That said, say you've got a small company and that's what we're seeing this year, this Christmas season right now. Um, You've got, a, you've got a small retailer or even a medium-sized retailer that is part of one of these fraud consortiums, all right? So they, they sign on with one of these fraud security companies that says, okay, we take the data set of all of our customers, all of these retailers, we put them together, and that helps us define or recognize fraud. Mm-hmm. So if fraud happens someplace else, before it hits you, we already recognize it over here. That way they don't, they don't rob you either. That works great until criminals figure out, well, just because the good guys can use fraud consortiums, why can't the bad guys? Well, they can. And the way that happens, the way it's happening right now, a lot of people, and you guys may have heard the same thing, but a lot of people are receiving packages that they did not order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is the question. And here's one of the answers. If you've received a package that you did not order, say that package consists of socks or tennis shoes. All right. So the tennis shoe company or the athletic shoe company may be part of a consortium. Now, the fraudster knows that socks or athletic shoes from this one specific company, the amount of fraud that that company is hit with is very low. People simply don't use stolen credit cards there. So he can – and the dollar amount is very low. Mm-hmm. So he knows when he submits this, that order using stolen credit card details, he knows the order is going to go through. Right. He knows that. Not only that, but he's also ordering the product to the actual card owner's address. Now, why would he do that? That credit card order, because it's in a consortium, the actual account holder, his device that he's ordering product with is already associated within that consortium. Now, if he can somehow register or whitelist just his device in that consortium as well, associated with a stolen credit card, that works wonders for him. So to do that, he hits a company that's low level, mm-hmm. that, that's easy enough to card. He has the product sent to the actual address. When that happens, it white if, if he's using a Samsung device, a mobile device to order, to, to, to use stolen credit card information to place an order, it whitelists that Samsung device within the entire fraud consortium. It basically says, okay, so when another merchant looks at that order, a little screen pops up and it says, okay, this, this has already been associated with this device. Mm-hmm. It looks good. No frauds associated. That way, the merchant already feels good about the order. So he places the order with tennis shoes to the actual card owner's device. Then he goes over and he finds somebody that's selling iPhones. Right. It's already been whitelisted through the athletic store. Places the order on iPhones to a different address. 
the merchant that's selling the phones looks at their screen. On the screen, it's got the little screen that says, oh, this car's already been ordered. Everything's fine. So it's fine over here as well. That's typically the way a lot of this fraud works. Now, to do that, you have to – it's like we talked about before. You have to share information. Mm -hmm. So what's the big products? What stores have you guys had that that's successful? Um, have you got any tips? What bins are you using? All this kind of stuff, the amount of preparation and research that goes into actually hitting a store or a fraud consortium or anything like that is really up there. I used to be the guy that uh, I, tell, I tell companies when I go in, you know, the only people who read terms of service are fraudsters. Nobody else reads those things. But for a fraudster or, or a cyber criminal, that's that's good information. You can find out payment policies. You can find out shipping mm-hmm. policies. Sometimes you can find out what fraud provider they use, things like this. And that's exactly what you want to know. So what type of security does the company have? Does it have its own security? Is it farming it out to somebody else? Well, if it's farming it out to one of these companies, is there a guide somewhere or somebody knows something about how to get past that type of security? Is it device ID? Are they simply going by geolocation? Uh, what's going on there? But as far as a target, smaller businesses are good. Larger businesses are good if they if they have changed fraud teams. Right. That's That's one of the big ones. Travel companies are good. Everything's good. It's just what can a fraudster do and how quick can he turn around the product or service that he's stealing from? Fantastic. Brett, thank you very much indeed for sharing some of those insights. Thank you. It's been I a real pleasure. It. Thanks for tuning in to the conversation with former cyber criminal Brett Johnson in conversation with ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin. Coming up, we've got something special for our listeners. Be sure to tune in for a special four part series in which Brett tells his story. If you're not lucky enough to have a job, you might be involved in some sort of fraud. Uh, my mom was the fraudster of the family. She was like the captain of the fraud industry. So I grew up in that lifestyle. My first crime was 10 years old. I I financed my first marriage by faking a car accident. And shortly after that, I found the internet and took to it like a duck to water. You'll hear it all. How Brett first came to work for the United States Secret Service as a consultant and informant before going on a cross-country crime spree, being placed on the U.S. Most Wanted list, being recaptured, serving time in prison, escaping prison, being captured yet again, and finally accepting responsibility for his actions. It's an amazing conversation. We know you won't want to miss it. In the meantime, for more resources for CISOs and anyone looking to enhance the security of their business, please visit securityforum.org. And we'd like to hear from you. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or someone you'd like us to interview, get in touch through our website or tweet us at Security Forum. Thanks for listening.